he's not fine with uncertainty. It would impede his happiness and his social structure if he if he asked too many questions and realized that he doesn't have good answers for them. Today, I'm speaking with Anthony Magna Bosco. Anthony runs a YouTube channel where he does something called street epistemology. It is basically a way to take a belief that someone holds and really just examining why people hold that belief. Now, Anthony's work really ties in neatly with my vision to spread metacognition, metacognitive ability, if you will, essentially making people smarter, making people more informed, not just of the surrounding world, but first and foremost about themselves. So Anthony is probably the least known person I've interviewed here on MetaQuest so far, but I actually predict that he's just about to become a very well-known person because his videos are really taking off. They're getting tens of thousands of views, all of them, and I'm leaving links for all that below. Before we dive into the interview, I have 20 seconds of housekeeping. First of all, a big thank you to Crypto.com, which is a crypto and fiat visa debit card provider, and you can get yourself one of these cards and a 2% cash back on all purchases and a free $50. Just click the link below this video and thank you so much to Crypto.com. Also, I'm working on a metacognition test, so uh, and it's gonna be completely free to take, so you can look forward to that. And please do subscribe to this podcast or channel, depending on where you're listening to it. It really helps me out and it doesn't cost you anything, but it has value to me. I'm your host, Asko Fallman. This is the MetaQuest Podcast. Anthony Magnabosco, welcome on the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. We've been trying to plan this for a few weeks. Right. We managed to slip it in. It took after the holidays, I suppose. But yeah, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for yeah, having me. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm super stoked that you're here. Um, and as I wrote, I think I wrote to you that I watched 20 or 30 or so of your street epistemology videos. But I actually counted it last night. Turns out I've watched 71 of your videos. What? Oh, that's great. Right. Sometimes when I do interviews, I wonder how many examples the interviewer watched. Because sometimes right. I get the impression that maybe they just watched two or three, and those were ones that I did several years ago. And then I, I sense that I have to do a lot of building to, to uh, clear up some misconceptions about the method. Because I think we've improved a lot since then. So if you've watched 71, right. then you probably have a really good understanding of what it is we're doing. Right. That's, but that's, that's the thing. Uh, sometimes it might even be a disadvantage because I, some of the questions that, that are, that seem obvious to me now might be the ones that someone who isn't familiar with your work would actually like to know about, but let, let's just mm. talk about street epistemology. Yeah. I, I know it stems from a book by uh, Peter Bogashian, um, but am I understanding correctly that it's essentially what is known as Socratic method? I think so. I, I'm not all that familiar with the Socratic method. I learned street epistemology first, and then the, the author purported that it's based on the Socratic method. I don't really know that much about it. I've, I've read a little bit into it, but I, I can't really tell you how it's the same or different, but from my understanding, it does stem from it. it. It's largely based on asking questions. And with the Socratic method, you tend to ask a lot of questions. However, it seems like we're doing something different with SE. I think we are, we're broadening it out for one thing. It usually isn't high level minded concepts like what does it mean to be virtuous or something that you might get in a Socratic dialogue. We are more focused on things that people think are the case, things that people think are true and then exploring their reasons and their methods for getting at that conclusion. Is that actually what you do in the Socratic method? I don't think so. So I think there's some differences there, but I think at the heart of it, it was inspired by the Socratic method. And then Peter Bogosian wrote his book. People like myself started recording examples and practicing it and then sharing it with the broader community. And then it's becoming this thing, this, this amazing thing, I think. I, I'm quite enamored right. with it. And it seems to really be profoundly shaping how we are having discourse and right. discourse is really in trouble. So I'm very excited to be here to talk to you about it and to kind of hash out what it is to do street epistemology with you. 
I, I think the, the one of the reasons I watched 71 of your videos, I was- That's a lot. I was, I was frankly a little shocked. It's uh, bordering on pathological, right? But, um, but I think one of the reasons that happened was because it's just so exciting. I remember watching the first video. I think it's one of your most um, watched videos with this Latin American girl, Maritza. What's her name? Oh yeah, uh, mm -hmm. right, right. And it's but it, but it's just so on an emotional level. It's so intense watching these videos. Maybe especially the first yes. four or five videos you watch because it's like whoa. Is he? They're actually talking about this sensitive topic. Yeah, in public, on camera, and it's almost like a dream <laughs> because there, it, you, there, I, sometimes I cut to these wide shots and you see just the two of us speaking and then there's all this commotion going around, but we're focused, we're, we're talking. It's two humans having a respectful conversation about our deeply held beliefs and right. you don't tend to see that. So I get it. I, I feel emotional. I get emotional when I have these talks. In fact, right. I, at the end of the one that you, talk, that you mentioned, I think I got choked up at the end of it. I don't know if you oh. could pick up on it, but I was having a hard time formulating words when she was talking about how she wants to believe true things. Right. Right. It's, I think intense might be a key word here. Mm -hmm. Something that it's, okay. So I, I was actually hoping Anthony that we could do sort of a little <laughs> office epistemology session, if you will. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm not sure that I hold so many beliefs anymore. <laughs> Maybe we could, maybe it might be more productive to talk about the steps of how we would go about doing it right. rather than, because I've, I've done reenactments or um, even role play or even SEing somebody's view right. during interviews. And sometimes it doesn't go very well. And I'm worried it might cause people to not want to look into it further. I don't know why it doesn't go well sometimes. All I'm saying is that there's a vast body of video examples out there. And as you described, they're very profound and intense. I would maybe refer people to go to those. But if you want to like get into the mechanics of what it, what a typical conversation or interaction might look like, we can. I think that might be productive. I, let, let's do it. And I think um, okay. I guess we can use what I um, hinted at as a stepping stone to maybe. So 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 this all starts with you identifying a belief that someone has. You pretty much need a claim from an individual before you can explore their reasons for thinking that it's true. Right. So it kind of starts off with an understanding of what's motivating them to behave. Perhaps I think X is true. So once we have, once we have explored exactly what X is, then you can start using questions to get into the reasons why they think X is true and their methods for verifying the reasons that are well that that are the reasons for thinking that x is true there's a couple different like major stages of this but it, it's not a it's not a gimmick it's not a jedi mind trick it's not an off-the-shelf thing that you can just memorize these steps and and be proficient at it i mean you can get a good sense of how a conversation might flow in fact if you've watched 71 of them i would imagine that you probably would start getting a sense of I think I know what Anthony's going to ask next. I, I would imagine if you've watched that many of them. I mean, um, I, I I sometimes have that sense, but 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 there's also the the subtle clues that happen during a conversation. You're sort of dialed in to each other. That's I can't always pick pick up on that uh, watching it from a distance, so to okay. speak. But, 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 but I hear you. And, and I've actually, I tried uh, doing um, an epistemology session on a friend recently. Um, yeah. and, 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 and it went pretty well, really just, I, I had just tried to memorize the, the, the basic formula. You know, there's obviously you don't have to build rapport with, with your close friend. Mm -hmm. There's already some good chemistry there, but, um, but we ended up talking about karma and um, okay. And, and we hit this brick wall at one point because, um, so he said, so, so I, so I basically asked him, so he was, his main reason for this belief was the evidence he felt he saw. Okay, good. But there, there were some other things too, like he mentioned his own upbringing, culture, that kind of stuff. But then uh, the brick wall was, 
consisted of him saying that so if someone if something bad happened to someone he could he would he would then think ah that person must have misbehaved in some manner it's just mm-hmm. something i didn't know but if something good happened to a person he would then use that to conclude <laughs> the opposite that this person must be a very moral and uh a good person essentially whatever that means i see so it was very frustrating for me. I think mm. I watched, I, I, you've, you've done several videos uh, specifically on karma. Is, there, yeah. is it, that a thing with karma? Is it harder to? No, no. Um, karma, in my view, is one of the easiest things to explore with somebody. But I'm not saying that to, um, to discourage you or anything like that. Sometimes it can be <laughs> difficult to know where to go next. It's a common thing. Right. Sometimes I don't know where to go next. Sometimes I, I might say, Hmm, I'm not really sure what to ask you next. Maybe we should just end it and, and give me some time to think about it. And maybe you can think about it too. There's, there's no thinking that you need to rush through this could be one of the biggest mistakes when you go about using street epistemology. You want to take your time and you don't want to overwhelm your conversation partner or yourself. And if you're not exactly sure what to ask, I might say, I'm not, like I said, I'm just not really sure where to go. Maybe we could just wrap it up. Or if you were me, what do you think would be a good question for me to ask you next? You could do that's, something that, like that. That's a perfect question. That's, sure, that's sure. Excellent. Because they may give you a wonderful question that you can then ask, and then they can maybe respond to their own question. Right, right. Sometimes I even say something like, do you mind if we just summarize what you've said so far? And even just the act of recapping how far you've come in, in the first part of your dialogue might help you formulate a better question there too. But right. now, if I were if I were in in that situation, I think what he what your what your friend was explaining was his reasons why he thinks it's true. He observes people, and when he notices good things, he concludes that that must have been because they did something good, or vice versa. In street epistemology, we're interested in the epistemology or the method, the how. How did he determine? that the good thing that he is observing happening to his friend is a confirmation that that friend did something good in the past. It's the how that we're interested in. It's the how that causes people to take another look at their views. I would be really interested to figure out how he concluded that the good thing or the bad thing that happens to his friend has any relationship whatsoever to the action that that person did X days ago. Can you help me? Can you help me understand how you? I understand that you drew the connection, but why did you do it? What, what's? How did you get there? Can you right. take me through it? Right. Yeah, he, he'll he'll probably be watching this. I'll have to. Yeah, he's going to get his um <clears throat> his second piece of of, of magnet or whatever it is. <laughs> the puzzles. <laughs> well, you know, we we also have a Discord server and Facebook groups where people who may be watching this might be thinking. I want that guy to question me about this pet belief that I have. Mm. It's core to who I am. I want him to challenge. And I don't really have a lot of time to do that, but there's a community of people who are looking for, for practice. So if your friend or anyone else or yourself wants to be the one asking questions or they'll be the one surfacing their belief claim for, for respectful interrogation, right. then I would urge them to look into those those communities there. I mean, we're, we're going to leave links for all of that uh, below, okay. uh, but, but <laughs> great, great. I, mean, I was just thinking if you could get, if you could somehow activate all the, you, all the people that used to be internet trolls uh, for the past decade or so, if you can get those people into uh, online epistemology, that would be. Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> I, th- I think the videos sell it better than anything that I could probably say to you right now. Right. When right. That's, watch- the, that's, that, that's the thing. And, and I'm going to encourage people to, to watch your YouTube channel, watch those videos. It's so intense and it's such a learning experience. And <clears throat> Thank you. I, I think, so you touched on the, one of the major elements already, which is the, it is the, how did you arrive at this belief? What makes you confident? The second very important thing, uh, you kind of touched on this too, but in my um, from my perspective, is the the way you reflect what people say back. I I used to work in a sort of a clinical setting in um, social psychiatry uh, for half a decade or so, and remember I read a book about just reflecting what people told you essentially back to them in your own words, and I started using it with with the people I was mentoring, and the effect was 
so profound. It was, it was, it was, it was amazing. It it was amazing. amazing. Right. So, uh, but I was thinking, I think I overheard you say just in passing in one of your videos that you used to be um, confrontational. You would, you would be the, the mean uncle ruining a Christmas dinner, right? In a sense. Yes. And it's, it's so discouraging because I just had an incident, an incident with one of my family members who the last interaction that I basically had with them was when I was accusatory, ridiculing them, giving them facts and, and not doing anything that I do today with street epistemology. Mm. And they haven't been following any of my work apparently because they still thought I was going out to the Alamo and yelling at street preachers and ridiculing people. And I've come so far since then, but as early, like I'm talking like seven days ago, I was reminded that there are people who still think that, that I'm that old person. And it's very frustrating because I've grown so much. And for people to still think that I view religious people in that way really saddens me. Um, I have a deep, profound love and empathy for people, regardless of where they stand in any claim. And this approach has really helped me see that, see them as people. And they're just possibly running faulty software. I may be running faulty software. So I love, I love street epistemology as a tool because I think it could, it could help a lot of people who are going through angry atheist phases, for example, where they lash out <laughs> at their loved ones. Or if you're always arguing with your uncle about politics and it's just, it's, it's jeopardizing. Nobody wants to be around each other because they're just worried it's going to become a fight. This is an option to, for you. And I hope that this finds you in time so that you don't burn those bridges like me and many other people have done. This, right. this effect just seemed to change you also as a person. And it seems to calm people down. It seems to help you be a little bit more stoic about the world and all these actors that are in it. Right. I think someone asked you, this may have been um, in an interview you did somewhere. um, Have you ever encountered any, have you ever had to revise some of your own convictions? It does happen. Uh, There's a few views that I've, I've vacillated on or even shifted drastically. I tend to look at things now in terms of a, of a, of a confidence level that it's factually true. And it's a shifting scale depending on the experiences that I'm having or the people that I'm running into or the arguments that I'm discovering when I engage with people. So yeah, there are some views that I've changed on, but at the heart of it, I don't think I'm dogmatic about anything. So I'm not a hundred percent sure on pretty much everything. And I've met some theists who cackle when they hear that they think, you know, this, this silly deluded atheist, but it seems like it's the most honest position to be, but I've never quite, I've never quite really looked at all my beliefs as, um, as carefully as I started doing when I was going out and asking people about theirs. When you learn the method, you tend to turn it on yourself. That's a good thing. That's, that's valuable. I mean, that's if, if, if I have a, if I'm on a crusade of some sort that, that is almost per definition, the, the, the description of my crusade, it is the, just, just flip the camera around and, yeah. and zoom in on yourself. Like you can't really understand, you can't understand your interpretations of other people if you don't understand like how you yeah. tick essentially. That actually reminds me, there's a really valuable thing that we try to do in street epistemology when we're talking to people is not to, not to figure out how do I tear their argument down, but how do we figure out what their best argument is for thinking that that's true? Right. When you flip it that way, when you try to view it as let me, let's work together and figure out if karma is really true, like with your friend, that, that's, um, that collaborative mindset really changes the whole dynamic. And people will open up even more if they feel like they have a partner in this. This isn't right. an enemy. I, I don't need to circle the wagons and protect this view. I can let this fellow in and we can start looking at the whole situation and see what the foundation is. And if, if it's strong enough to hold everything that I'm piling up on top of it. 
Right. And, and, and what you're referring to there is also what's sometimes uh, referred to as the, the backfire effect, right? Where you, yeah, the more right. facts you present someone with that, that sort of goes against their pre-existing beliefs, the stronger the belief will become. There's some, there's some competing science on the backfire effect. The latest research, I think, seems to show that there are times where people will accept facts that show that they're mistaken, even on a deeply held belief. Mm -hmm. And yet it doesn't necessarily change their attitude towards it. So they may right. be willing to accept the claim that, okay, well, maybe, yes, CO2 levels are rising, but it's not going to shift my attitude whatsoever on, on, uh, on my position regarding thinking that global climate change is a hoax or something along those mm. lines. Right. Okay. So what, what are the, the most frequent themes that you encounter on your um, street epistemology Sessions. That's a good question. I think it might be regional for one thing. So me living in Texas, a lot of people are religious. Now I do sometimes do my interviews on college campuses and there's a fairly healthy mix of, of non-believers there too. But it seems like supernatural claims are very popular. More so, at least for me here in this area, than political claims. I'm trying to get more examples of political topics. And I even ask people to pick something. I give them a couple of different ideas of things that they, the claims that we can discuss, but they seem to very frequently want to talk about theistic claims. Mm -hmm. And I'm fine with that, honestly, Asker, because those views tend to be foundations for other beliefs that people hold. So for example, my view on gun control or abortion or what's going on between the United States and Iran at the moment may very well, the, 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 the underpinnings of that may very well be my religious outlook, how I'm viewing myself as a good person because I think God is real, perhaps, for example. So I'm completely mm -hmm. fine talking about theistic claims because I think there are so many other things built up on that. I like going down deep to the foundation and just talking about one specific aspect, one specific claim about, should the U S go to war or not, or something like that. It's almost, it's almost too superficial for me. I'd rather really go to the heart of it. Right. No, I can see that, that that's something I'm um, still struggling to teach myself, I guess is, is this, you want to cover so much ground, but if you really want to explore something with someone, it's typically better to just drill down. In yeah one aspect of yeah it. find out what's really propping up their view so if somebody says i am pro or against abortion a good or let's say, let's even make it simple like i think the earth is flat if mm. you ever meet somebody who says that don't start giving them links to show that the earth is a globe or a spherical object or something ask them if their view is dependent on something else and very often people who think that the earth is flat think that because they think they have a holy book that says it. So I might say something like, is your belief that the earth is flat dependent in any way on your view that there's a higher power? Right. And if they say, absolutely, yes, then I really wouldn't be talking about a flat earth. So you have to probe. You have to see what the real reasons are and then go where they take you. Right. This isn't about like driving them to your conclusion. It's having them take you on the ride and you basically the, be, be the passenger and say, why did you decide to go that way? Is there any re reason why you took this path rather than that one? Right. I mean, so this is, um, this might be uh, meandering a little bit away from what you're talking about, but I, I saw you gave a talk in Norway. I, I don't know when that was, last year? 2018, I think. Right, okay. But... So I grew up in Scandinavia, Denmark specifically, um, and one of the, mo and honestly, most people are, I don't know if, if it's fair to say that most people are, most people are definitely either atheists or agnostics back there. The, the, the church religion has really lost its, its foothold. Um, in those even, countries? In those countries. Mm -hmm. I, I think Norway might be the exception. I think there's a stronger um, Christian um, foothold there probably but 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 where i it's a minority least, if i understand right it's a more minority community maybe in the southern it, it's at least it's becoming a minority community but okay. but they, they they used to be very strong there but here's the thing i've actually noticed that 
when when I interact and when I when I talk to Scandinavian people who don't believe in God, they typically have no understanding of why they don't believe. Hmm. Because because they whereas when I compare that to American atheists who typically had a religious upbringing or something like that. Yeah. It's it's a much more you know I saw your uh, your joint video with uh, what's his name uh, Aaron Ra, mm-hmm. uh, and and he's just like he's a textbook example of that he he knows the Bible better than most biblical scholars right <laughs> because he grew up in it and he's 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 just loaded up on his ammo so to speak mm. studying the holy books so so much but it's actually interesting when you meet people with whom you agree, you share most opinions with them, but they haven't, they haven't been forced to reflect on why that is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes I almost feel like I can actually predict, this is a very strong word, I know that, but if we took this person and placed them in a religious setting, they could very well (laughs) be convinced by the religious arguments because they do not they don't have the, the the toolbox. They just happen to grow up in an uh, in an. Oh, I see what you're side. saying. This actually reminds me of a question somebody asked me once: like, if you could hit a button, Anthony, and completely get rid of religion tomorrow, or people, yeah, you could just completely wipe out religion, or or have people just stop believing in religious claims. Would you do it? And I said no because it it wouldn't correct the fundamental issue. Right, and that is the way that we're going about determining that things are true. It's usually a product of our upbringing, or we read it and we just we heard we thought it was a reliable source, and we just adopted it as true. The way that we formulate our beliefs and decide to revise them is is the big piece of it here. What exactly we think are is true, like religious claims, that's just a uh, is that a symptom? Yeah, that's just like the outcome of it. So we need better tools, whether you were raised as, a, as an atheist in Norway or, or somebody who was really religious in Saudi Arabia. It doesn't matter. You, the, you can still utilize the tool. Um, right. You also have me thinking that one of the reasons why atheists, maybe in North America, perhaps, or maybe specifically the United States, that you might be noticing a lot of us spend a lot of time defending our lack of belief or our non-belief or our belief that there are no gods. I think it's mainly because we're surrounded by so many people who think that it's true. Right. And that's the motivating factor for us to be more vocal about why we don't believe. Whereas if you look at somebody who's in a, in a country where 80% of the population are atheists, well, there's no really, there's no, there's not a lot of opportunity to have to explain why you don't believe. No. There's really not that 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 and it, I, I was I guess I was just um I was just interested to hear about those types of differences because you've interviewed so many people I know I know most of them uh, were in Texas but but you've talked to so many people so I'm just interested in like the patterns you encounter oh maybe. well I mean the patterns are pretty much the same whether you whether you don't believe in a god or you do or or even it almost doesn't matter what the claim is. The pattern is generally the same. Right. Um, we, we think we have good reasons for thinking it. We probably haven't really spent a lot of time exploring those reasons. Or sometimes when you're asked on the spot, why do you think that that's true? Your mind might be racing to give an answer that may not necessarily be the answer. That's a common thing that I see. Right. And uh, you can easily test that to say, if we discovered together that that's not a good reason, would it affect your confidence in the claim? And if they say no, ask them for the other reason and keep repeating that until you can identify something that would decrease their confidence the most and then focus on that. And then the second part of that is get into how. How did you conclude that that reason, now that we've dusted everything off and we've set those five first reasons aside that really aren't reasons that affect your confidence, and now we have the sixth one here? How did you conclude that that's a good reason? What's your method? Take me through your process. And that's where the magic happens. That's where the beauty of this approach really seems to shine. Right. 
Right. I I love how you always you really always say what make what make you what makes you sure that the God exists. You you use the the, the that uh-huh. you use there. It sort yeah. of ob- objectifies it a little bit. Or is that a yes. conscious choice? <laughs> it's a conscious choice. Sometimes I say, how could we be so sure that the God is actually real? Or what? if somebody else believes in a different God, how can we tell that that your God is any different than theirs? I try to. I slip in that word a God or the God to help distance themselves and be a little bit more object, objective. Like you said, like take a little look at it, like a God, the God, not my God or God. And right. I think just that one little change can shift, can shift things a little bit. Now I have had people push back on that and say, what do you mean? The God it's God. <laughs> <laughs> so watch for that. And don't, don't die on that hill. Drop the the and drop the a, and go with God from that point on. Because if if it will, if it's going to throw a monkey wrench into the gears, then set it aside and don't do it. But what's interesting is that I've noticed this, and I I didn't even notice it until like maybe the last year. But I'm noticing that when I say a God or the God, my conversation partner tends to adopt that language, which right. is really interesting. I would think that they would just keep saying God. But I have noticed people saying a God or the God. Right. Now, maybe they just always do that. And, and that's just how they use that word too. But I do think it was kind of interesting that are they actually, are they being so objective about this that they're adopting my objective language and looking at it this way? Right. It, it almost strikes me as what happens is that they accept, okay, these are, these seem to be the rules of this game we're playing right now. Maybe. And, I'm, and maybe they're deferring on. to me because I'm older than a lot of the people that you see in some of the more recent videos. Perhaps, right. perhaps they're subconsciously being deferential to me and adopting my own language when I, I would hope that that's not the case. I'm simply doing that little verbal trick, I suppose, to see if they will be willing to object to be a little bit more objective in looking at their claims. Right. And it seems to work pretty much across the board. It seems like but it. I'm, yeah. I'm so glad I asked you about that because this is something that... <laughs> Somebody just recently commented on one of my videos about that. So, I, yeah, it's kind of fresh on my mind. Right, right, right. So I'm, I'm also a little interested to hear... I know that sometimes you encounter people who maybe they just lost a close relative or mm-hmm. something, something along those lines. And and you actually decide to you know we're not going to challenge their beliefs right now because right now it provides too much of a comfort to them I guess, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but but it strikes me that there may be and this is this is sort of like okay let me just tell you my anecdote and get your perspective on it so when I moved to the U S about five six years ago I guess it's so easy to just you go to another country and you go there and you're like, Oh, you should just change this, these laws. So it's like my country, right? We have it all figured out. And I think gun control is a good example of that. But (laughs) so I just, my initial take was just, Oh, just change, just, just ban the whole thing, make all guns illegal. You know, you can do it. You can use it for hunting, but you need a special license for that. That's it. Right. But then you, you sort of, get to know the culture a little bit and you realize, okay, there might be some different dynamics at play here that I'm, that I just don't understand yet. So maybe I'm, I'm being a little, I'm rushing this, my judgment of this a little bit. And I think where I'm at at the moment is if people understand that more people will die inevitably each year, if we have millions of guns um, everywhere, more or less. But if you understand that, and you still choose, if you still choose to say, yes, but to me, this is so important that that's a price I'm willing to pay. Mm-hmm. I can, I may actually be willing to accept that. Mm. I mean, what, what, you see where I'm going with this? Sometimes people hold beliefs that you don't agree with, but they do understand, they do know why they hold those beliefs. And sometimes they seem willing to pay the price. Yeah. I mean, that there are some people who have justifications that we, we would find really problematic for maintaining their view. And if that's their position, you can still challenge them on it. You can still explore it. It's funny you actually bring up that example because the next video, well, this there'll be one more video, but then this, the one after that will probably be about gun control where mm. where it's about an individual who thinks that 
everyone should have guns in the United States. There should be no, there really shouldn't be any rules about what kind of gun a person could have. And we explore the reasons behind it. And initially it was, well, it says so in this, in this constitution, in this uh, amendment. And we explore to see if that's really his reason. And if I think that the question that I'd asked him is if the, if the United, if the U S citizens use the processes in place set up by our founding fathers to change that amendment and put restrictions on weapons, would you still be for everyone having weapons? And he said, yes. So it really had nothing to do with the, the, the fact that it's there, there's a legal justification at the moment for being able to have any gun that you want. It really came down to, personal protection, I think was his thing. But then we explored the limitations. How far is he willing to go? And I think at the end, at the end, if I remember right, at the end of the conversation, he seemed to be talking in a much more progressive or left leaning terms than he did at the start. So that was fascinating to watch. But yeah, I mean, we're surrounded by people who have problematic beliefs and they may very well have justifications for them. We may not think that they're good justifications, but there's still value in unearthing it for everybody. Right. Why exactly do you think that this is true? They sometimes ask her, it's quite possible. And you mentioned this earlier, th- this idea of listening and then repeating it back, that idea of active listening. You can do that with the things that you're hearing your conversation partner say. And in the act of repeating it back to them, they may say, hold on a second. That's, that's a really good summarization of what I said, but now that I'm hearing it, you've got me thinking. Right. So there's value in that. There's value in having these discussions. And some people may not necessarily understand how problematic their views are until they first engage in these dialogues. Right. I mean, so, so that's one outcome scenario, but mm-hmm. I, I guess I was thinking about Another scenario where people, where people play along, they, 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 they use the method and they explore the reasons and they actually maybe reach a new, uh, a broader understanding of why they believe what they believe. Mm -hmm. But after that, some people might choose, might say, okay, I might be delusional, but I am, but I find value in this belief. Mm -hmm. What, 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 what is your, um, I mean, I'm, I sort of suspect that we all do that to some degree. I think I do it too. I, I, I mean, it's hard to see when it's subjective, right? But, 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 but what are your thoughts on that? Because I know you, you've met some people who would say, yes, it might be delusional, but if I am, I don't want to know. That's a good question. Well, there are some people who are, are they're, they're happy to be willfully ignorant and they double down on it and they confirm to you that that's really their position. Mm. If that's the case, I might explore with them how they would think if one of their children had was just as dogmatic, but on the opposite view, would you want them to be closed off to revising their position? Now they may say, I don't care. Sometimes people say they don't care if they don't, I don't really give a shit what anyone around me thinks. Right. Some people do say that and some people really do, do mean it. But if you, if you take a little t- time to think about the impact of millions of people running around with views that are likely not true, and I think we're living in that environment, Mm. then you can see the harm that can come from it. And uh, sometimes it's just a few questions where you can help a person understand, oh, yeah, I guess if my sibling, if my child held a competing view and she was just as closed off in being, uh, in, in, she's just as closed off to changing her mind as I am, yeah, I guess I can kind of see how that could be problematic, especially if she's raising my grandkids. You sometimes have to frame it Yeah, this is all about helping people take another look at things and sometimes setting their view aside, but overlaying the logic that a person is getting to a competing conclusion might be just what you need to help break through to your conversation partner. Mm. I still don't know if that answered your question. Um, We do get value from our beliefs. There's no question about it. I, I think that's likely why we hold them because they're filling holes in our, in our matrix, you know, in, in our map of reality. We're, we're sticking stuff in there and it seems to work and that provides value. I can sleep at night. I don't have to be stressed out about, about things. I feel loved. I feel like I'm going to see my loved ones again. Maybe if I have that, those pieces in place. Um, but there could be value still in 
taking a look at how other people seem to get value from competing views. How do you think somebody who doesn't think that that's true copes? And it's quite useful to having them explore how that other person gets by without thinking that what they find so valuable, if that wasn't in the, in the mix, how could I actually cope? I, I think if, if I were to take a step back and describe your, your SE method in, in broader terms, I think I would say that what you do is you force people to look at the structure and not the content. I mean, that's one way of saying it. At least. Um, I think, well, the word force worries me a little bit. Oh, I'm that, sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. You, you help people. Encourage you maybe. People. My, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, I'm not like, you have to talk to me so we can do this. No, that's not what you do. It's absolutely right. not. I, I want people to know fully what they're getting into and, and they're consenting to doing it. Right, right. But yeah, you're right. I'm not interested in the claim. I'm interested in the structure. What right, is- but, but, but it's so fascinating because I often see like right when you encounter people and they agree to do the interview and they agree to, to be filmed and all that stuff, mm-hmm. they, they, some, they're quite often they assume, so now you're going to start the discussion, right, about the, the claims and it's all about the content. And, and th- this is something, this is actually something I caught myself doing. I don't know how, how um, I, I don't remember exactly what I wrote in, in the first email I sent you, but but this, I used to run this YouTube channel. I would talk about cryptocurrencies, about money, all, all that jazz. And one of the things I caught myself doing over and over again was just delivering um, opinions mm-hmm. with no facts to back it at all. Mm. And, and, and I really grew very frustrated with myself on, on that basis. You, 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 what is what is what is the worth of an, an opinion if mm. number one there's no evidence if you can't back it up or you can't well, back it up you can't well, even explain why it's there yeah i mean if you surround yourself with people who are familiar with this method and you likely will get called on it like i'm so much more careful now whenever i even if i type something on facebook messenger i might say something like um, I can't meet with you for lunch today because I'm likely doing a podcast today. Right. I'll, I'll slip in the word likely because I'm not absolutely sure that it's the case. Mm. So um, you tend to be a little bit more careful with what you say because I'm surrounded now by people who will ask me, why do you think that? What's your biggest reason? How did you conclude that that's a good reason? And you start doing it yourself. So I would imagine, do you still do it today? I mean, you've watched 71 videos. Have the videos themselves affected you in any way? Yeah, I, I, definitely. I mean, would you would you write there, a similar email? You know, yeah. I'm just wondering if you've grown as a person. Are you a little bit more epistemically humble about what it is you think you know? After, so uh, so I we can get into this a little more, but I think my my starting point must have been. Much, very much different from from yours, probably, because um, I actually think my starting point, sort of, was along these lines: was to address topics and people with a certain humility, not necessarily assuming that I had all the answers. Mm. And then, at some point, I guess I realized, no, this is too vague. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting anything out of life with it. I it was a little too self erasing sort of that's not the correct term here i'm sure but it was self-defeating in a, in a sense so i had to overcompensate i guess is what happened i went complete different camp started doing that being more assertive being uh you know <laughs> which was definitely a good thing for me on a personal level but now it's about finding the balance in in those two extremes i guess mm-hmm. for me personally mm-hmm. but i do so this very interesting example you bring up with the being accurate and and not just saying that i, I can't do it providing no reason or i'm scheduled for a podcast because you know you are scheduled for a podcast but it may fall through right it may not happen and you don't want to say something that's inaccurate is that correct is that yeah pretty much I'm I'm always aware that I could be putting too much confidence in what I think is actually the case. 
even something as benign as constructing a message when somebody asks me if I want to go to lunch because I think that I'm actually doing a podcast today. So, you know so why? Saying? So let me ask you this. So, so why why is that important in that specific instance? Why is it important that that your messenger message is correct? That's a good question. Maybe just for consistency. Like if if I do this on the most important beliefs in my life, why wouldn't I be consistent and do it on the mundane? I mean, mm. it's not that much more difficult, but it may just be very well because my brain functions differently now than when I did SE. And maybe that's just so ingrained in me that it just naturally sort of bubbles up. And I'm like, oh, I got to make sure that I slip in that word likely. Or it seems like, um, I think maybe at the heart of it, it comes down to uh, wanting to be really frank about what it is I can claim to know to be factually true. Mm. And there's very little that I think that that can be the case. So it, I think it it permeates or um, it surfaces in other areas of my life. That's a really good question. I don't know. And maybe also, maybe it, maybe down, maybe subconsciously, I'm thinking this is a really good way to model epistemic humility to the person that I happen to be messaging. And maybe mm -hmm. like in, in a very subtle way, they might be like, I wonder why Anthony put in seams about that podcast or <laughs> likely maybe they'll start thinking about it too. I don't really have, I don't know if I have a really good answer for you on that. But, but you, uh, you just gave me three really interesting answers. When I asked you that question, I, I really had no idea where, where you would go with that. But I think, <laughs> but what I heard, I'm going to reflect back to what you, what I heard okay. you just say. <laughs> I mean, we, I guess we can add too many meta layers. That That's probably mm. a, a thing that could happen. But, but I, th I think it's really, so you're very focused on this. You're, you're zoomed in on this epistemological way of thinking. Zoomed in is a really good way to put it. Right. And of course, I'm, we, I've primed both of us subconsciously. I already used the word zoomed and we're talking on Zoom. So there's a priming <laughs> thing going on there. But what I heard you say is that, and I think this is being, this might be my psych psychology background kicking in here, but I think you're in this mindset. You've, you, you, you've been training yourself, so to speak, uh, for, for three, four years now actively mm -hmm. um, on the barricades with this. So, so, but if we, if we look at the brain as, as a plastic entity, you're basically rewired. You've, you've created some new synaps synapses, right? Some new I think that's fair to say. Right. And that's yeah. what, this is a great answer. And even if it's not true, it could be true. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're discussing it makes me think about it more. So the next time I find myself crafting a, a, te a text message and slipping in wiggle words, you know, so that I'm not just locked down too much, it, it may, it, I may have a fourth answer for you, you know, it, right. it, and I might discard the two that I surfaced, two of the three that I discur surfaced there. So uh, that's tough. But I don't know if I'd want to go back. I, 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 it's, it's kind of liberating to not have to struggle to come up with reasons why you think something is true. I could simply just say, I don't really think I have a good reason for it, or I need to get back to you on it. It's okay to take the time. It's definitely okay to say, I don't know, or I'm not sure why I think that that's true. It's uh, there, there, there are a lot of people who are, who are not comfortable with saying, I don't know. I met a guy at a university, I'm in the process of up uploading our uh, editing our second conversation where he says something like, I hate uncertainty. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. a strong one. And we have this wonderful meta discussion where we zoom in and we talk about, we talk about that. And uh, that, at the end of it, I think I even, I don't, I don't do a lot of telling in my interviews. You probably noticed that it's more, pretty much about what my conversation partner thinks. Mm -hmm. But in this one, I spent a little bit more time saying, uh, it, it might be more costly to acknowledge that you don't know things rather than act as if you do know them. It might be, it might take more energy. It might take more calories. It might take more effort to say, I don't know the answer to that. And I'm going to just have to ride out on this fence of, I don't know, or uncertainty. And, uh, but it seems like it's the most honest position to be. 
But once you come to grips with that, hanging out on that fence of uncertainty, it's not lonely because there are other people that are there with you, for one thing. And it kind of takes the pressure off. I don't have to maintain a lifestyle that's based on something that I'm pretending to be the case, possibly. Right. <laughs> you follow me? So yeah. there's something there's something a little bit more honest and and hmm, human, perhaps, about it. But we don't. Well, well, do you have we, any in intuitions about why so many people have a hard time saying I don't know? I I suspect it's probably a result of our of our evolutionary history that our brains probably race to find answers to things to explain how the world is operating. And if we don't have the answers to it, we're very good at coming up with answers, even though they're not good answers, mm. but they fill those, they fill those holes and they allow us to go to sleep and move on to the other thing. And we rarely go back to look at those, those stop gaps that we've put in to fill the holes. And that's the purpose of this approach of street epistemology. Right. Let's go back to the, the biggest hole that you've plugged. <laughs> the one that's, that's, that's profoundly shaping how you navigate your world. And let's take another look at that. Right. I'm, I'm sometimes, I suspect, I mean, this doesn't really go against what you just said, uh, but sometimes I suspect that the social value of many of these phenomena that you encounter mm -hmm. during your talks, that the, that the social value really is what reinforces many of these beliefs. I mean, the, the cost of, of some young uh, or 20 year old who just started in college or something like that, just coming home to your family and say, hey, guys, I don't believe in God, right? That's, right. Uh, you're going to pay a high social price for that. Not even, even social. Uh, it, it could be a financial cost, emotional, oh, it, 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 physical, but yes. So many levels, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gosh, it, it, and it can cost you. It can cost you your relationship. It could cost you your fiance, and it can cost you it, your future. You you could right? in some countries you could be killed for right. expressing doubt about a re a religious claim. Right, you'd be ostracized. You could be kicked out of your house. Okay, I'm out of the house. I can't pay for college anymore. Therefore, I got to get a job. Your entire future could be dependent on when you come out with your doubts, mm. and. Some, for some, the cost is too high. The, the individual that I was just referring to, um, the first video was up. I don't know if you've seen it or not yet, but we talk about this. We talk about the, the social cost. And for him, the social cost was too high. It's mm. too high, at least at that point in his life. I did see I might actually be, it, yeah. forget, I might be merging the first and the second conversation together. So maybe there's some spoilers here. But at this point in his life, he's not ready to question too much because he's not fine with uncertainty. It would impede his happiness and his social structure if he, if he asked too many questions and realized that he doesn't have good answers for them. So I think he's, he's content with pretending that it's true because of the benefits he gets from it. And that's fascinating to me. That's a, that's a fascinating thing for a stranger to reveal to me on camera by asking these questions. And thousands of people will watch that and they, they may very well be in his shoes on a completely different belief or they know somebody that it will give us a better perspective of how we're thinking about these beliefs from these examples. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't think of very much more exciting than, than peeling back like the curtain on how our brains are operating with these things. It's so fascinating right. to me. I, I can't, there's very few things that I think would be more interesting than this. I don't know. I am puzzled by why did I, why, why, why did I, why did you and I and, and other people, why are we, because it becomes an obsession, right? At some point. <laughs> obsession. It's definitely a passion of mine. If I discovered that this was harming people or it wasn't as effective as I think that it is, I don't think that I would have much difficulty setting it aside and trying to focus on something else. What if you discovered it harmed, say, 2 to 3% of the people you spoke with and it really helped all the rest of them? That's a good question. I guess, what do, what do we mean by harm? 
like they would have a nervous <laughs> breakdown or would they go on a shooting spree? Or, I mean, what are, let's say, what are let's say, about? uh, one point uh, 0.1% uh, took their own life, mm. but the rest, but the rest had significant improvements across the board. Um, I think I, I wish would leave I didn't it. Ask. No, 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 it's a great question. And I think I would leave, this is what I tend to do. Whenever I get a whiff or a sense that a person is particularly dependent on this belief, I tend to ask them if kind of, this actually came up in the conversation with Maritza that you mentioned, hmm. do you want to believe true things? How important is it for you to believe true things? If you discover that it might be painful, how would you cope? How do you think other people cope? That is a really good way to test the waters to see how problematic is belief revision going to be for this person. Mm -hmm. Are they uniquely dependent on it? Because I have ended conversations with people who do seem to be uh, uh, particularly dependent on it being in their life. So I might say something like, if we discovered that 0.1% of the people who engage in these conversations end up harming themselves or other people, is it something that you'd still want to participate? I I try to let them make the call rather than just sort of blindly be the bull in the china shop and just steamroll over them. Right. Um, I mean, I actually have um, a friend of mine texted me something something along these lines just yesterday because I was telling him about, you know, I'm sort of trying to develop this metacognition test, which is not a thing that's really out there. Um, But it's actually kind of hard to to understand what it is and therefore also to to test it and 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 he's he brought this up what you're talking about this um uh, but but it could be dangerous right and like yeah but 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 at some point i think we need to just draw a line and say that some things can be dangerous but but then you can a sign next to the highway can be dangerous, even if right. it just has a photo of a cup of coffee on sure. it. Or, or, or um, deciding to pray rather than going to a doctor could actually be dangerous. So maybe that's the assumption of the risk of formulating beliefs. Along with that comes the potential to harm yourself. Mm-hmm. So um, now whether, that, whether we're surfacing that because that's the out that we need to be able to challenge people on their beliefs and make us feel good about doing so, I don't know. But whether you, um, whether you explore your beliefs and you decide to revise them or you, or you decide to just simply protect those views and never challenge them, I think in either case, you're probably opening yourself to some potential risk. Hmm. Uh, but I think at the, at, the, at the heart of it, like at the at bottom line, it's up to the person to decide if they want to participate in the exploration. And I oftentimes try to watch, well, I try to watch really closely to see how they're responding to the questions. If they seem to be getting particularly agitated, I might back off and then wait for them to reach out. I actually, this actually happened with, with a woman. So a few years ago now, a uh, pagan, she thought that there was a pagan goddess protecting her. And I ended the, I ended the talk with her because she seemed unusually dependent on it, but she emailed me three hours later to say, I really enjoyed the talk, even though it might be difficult for me to rebuild my life without this view, I would like you to continue challenging me on it. So we met a second time on camera. Now, unfortunately she emailed about six months after that to say, Hey, look at, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for jobs now. And I don't, I'm not really crazy about those two videos being out there. Could you take them down? So I did, Mm. but it's just a wonderful example of sometimes we, um, sometimes we might be a little bit too cautious with people and thinking that they're not ready for it. When in reality they are, they do want to believe true things and they do like their beliefs being challenged. And even though it might be pricey and costly to rebuild and find new meaning and purpose and navigating the world that they are willing to do it especially when they realize that there's a community of other people that have done it. They found their way out. They've rebuilt. There are resources. There's a safety net for you. If you decide to challenge some of these views. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. I and mean, it's also that that's something that really separates the situation people in the U S are in. Uh, if we compare them to people in Saudi Arabia or some other um, theocracies out there, right? There is no safety net if you decide to mm. 
go this route. There might be an online community, but even then you have to be pretty careful. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Anthony, I, I want to move it along. I, 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 okay. I mean, I, I love this. Uh, now, now we're drilling down into some interesting stuff here, but but I but I do have some questions I want to plow through. Okay, <laughs> so is this going to be the lightning time. round or something different? <laughs> I mean, that's that's well, I, I can't tell you in advance, basically. But I but for, okay. first of all, I'm just a little. I just have to ask you about your your background. I heard you yeah. say that you're you were raised Catholic. Yep. So so what happened? Or, what happened to me? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happened to me. I wasn't abused or beaten or anything like that. Uh, the nuns would get a little, you know, reckless with their with their hands and slapping people every once in a while. But oh. it, it, yeah, but it, it wasn't like um, I was angry at anybody. I just wasn't convinced. Like at a young age, I was always questioning. I thought I was made up. But all the people around me were acting as if it was true. So I just went along with it. And it wasn't until I was probably in my 20s or you know, mid-20s, I suppose, where I realized, oh, there's a word for this. It's called atheist. Mm -hmm. I don't, there's people who don't believe this. I don't believe it. I guess, I guess that's me. But I didn't really think too much more about it until I started having kids. And then when you start seeing the harms that these beliefs can cause people on a, mac on a macro level, like wars to, to the micro of you know, somebody not being served in a restaurant because they they have a cross around a, a, a religious symbol around their neck that's not a cross. That's when you start. This for me, that's when I started um, being a little bit more interested in how are we forming these views? What are they based on? What would it take to change a person's mind? What works? What's effective and what's not? So, right. But yes, to answer your question, I was raised in a religious household in a religious community. All my, I didn't know one person who didn't believe this for the first 20 years of my life. Did, did, it, um, did, you, did you have to pay any social price for like c coming out, so to speak? When I eventually came out, I was not aware of this method. So I did, I paid a huge social cost in that. And I mentioned this at the very start. I jeopardized a lot of relationships with my loved ones mm. that are, that are, apparently still damaged to this day. I, I, I thought uh, that th some, some of these have been repaired, but uh, I'm just made to find that they're not. So, so that's been tough, but I, I went through it. I, I went about it in the wrong way. I wasn't aware of this approach of asking people why they think it's true rather than telling them why I think that they're wrong. Mm. And that was a huge profound shift. Now, what's really cool is that I've, I've had family members reach out to me and even friends who say, I watched that whole blow up that you did it with, with your family. And that was just a huge train wreck. But me observing that and then learning this different way of engaging with people using questions like we do in street epistemology, I've managed to avoid a lot of that. So I'm grateful that you went through it. So <laughs> in, in, in a way, I suppose people have benefited from my blunder at the start which is good, I suppose, but it, it would have been much better, I suppose, if, if I had learned this approach and, and approached it in a completely different way with them. Right. I, I, I couldn't help noticing. Uh, so when I asked you about your Catholic upbringing, you sort of see, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but you seem to assume that I assumed that, uh, <laughs> that, that something bad had happened to you. Oh, well, I thought you said something like, what happened to you? I did say what happened. Oh, you thought, uh, okay, yeah, I did assume negative. Well, I think I only said that because it's a very common thing to hear as an atheist when you explain to somebody that you don't believe and they do believe in a God. Mm. Their typical question, is, or yeah, their typical question is, well, did you, did you get abused? Did something bad happen to you? Mm. So I think my mind just naturally went there and thinking of it in terms of the negative. Right, I, I guess there might be an, an extra element of that because of the word catholic yeah with yeah exactly the, when you yeah. mention catholic in childhood there's there's now this association <laughs> of, of oh he must have been abused or something but that that wasn't the case <laughs> right, right. No, i i had a i have a i had a very loving family that and the teachers were great mm. uh we did family you know family events and and church picnics and all this stuff and it was wonderful i i just wasn't convinced that the claims were true which 
which is, gosh, it's, it's, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. We've covered so many things here. It's crazy. It, it is uh, crazy. And, and, and it's going to get even worse now um, as we're okay. uh, wrapping this. But yeah, sorry. Like Sometimes a common I, thing. Oh, please. Hmm. Okay, let's, 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 keep pro, let's keep progressing. I'm, I'm fine. Hmm. All right. A common thing that I hear and that I, I know you've heard this a uh, hundred of times probably is we need religion to have morality. Oh, yeah. And, and I don't think we actually have to elaborate. I think we both disagree with that statement. But I hear this from people who don't believe in anything and also for people that I highly respect and are very intelligent. But I'm actually, I would love to hear your take on, I do think to some degree that I don't believe that morality is, that we would, wouldn't have any morality with, without religion. I've, I've, I'm, 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 there's plenty of evidence we can, we can provide for that. But, but I do think that it's probably reasonable to say that morality you and I have and, and other non-religious people have, it is probably to some degree influenced by the way religions express morality. I actually had this mm. discussion with a friend recently that I realized this, you have to always be honest. And then I started creating these fictional examples that, yeah, but let's say you have a kid. Let's say you're in Disneyland with your five-year-old daughter. Then your doctor calls you, tells you your daughter is going to die tomorrow. Mm. And this is an absurd example. I realized that. And, and then your daughter turns and asks you, who was it? What did they say? Mm -hmm. Are you going to tell your five-year-old daughter at her happiest hour in Disneyland that she's going to die tomorrow? Because honesty is always important. Mm. I mean, well, to, to just go back quickly to the morality thing, I do think that we can, we can be good people and try to improve the world and reduce harm without any religions whatsoever or without thinking that there's a God. In that particular instance, for a five-year-old, I, I would probably just, I would probably lie to her. Um, if she was 15, perhaps it would be different. I might ask her what she wants to know. Mm -hmm. Would you like to understand, would you like me to disclose the results of that phone call, even though it might be negative? Or would you like to continue enjoying our day and leave the choice up to them? Right. So it's, it's tough, it's tough. Uh, I, I mean, I, I guess what I was trying to get at is I 100% agree and I see much hypocrisy too um, among people. Like as, as soon as people embrace an ideology, it doesn't even have to be religious uh, for that matter. It seems to be, it's really just rules that don't orient themselves towards the context of the situation. These rules are just universal. They're always, they're constants in a sense. And, and I'm not, sometimes I catch myself doing that, like especially in moral questions. And I can actually see, if I look back over the past two, three years, I've done plenty of things in an effort to be as moral as I possibly could, only to learn that they harmed me and other people. Hmm. Hmm. I don't, honestly, I don't know what to really add to that other than uh, your conversation has reminded me that Bogosian's latest book called How to Have Impossible Conversations specifically talks about the moral epistemology that could be underlying our views and how we interact with the world and other people. Mm. Um, when you think that you're, you're a good person because you hold a particular view, it could be extremely challenging to even consider that you might be wrong on that view. And exploring the morality of, of these beliefs. How, how can a person be moral without thinking that there's a God? You might actually, that might be a, a critical conversation that you might first need to have with somebody before you can explore with them how they determine that their holy book is true. Mm. They might be more open to belief revision if they can see that there are other ways that I can be morally good than thinking that this God is real. Um, I don't know if that's exactly where you're planning to take that thing, but you've made, I was actually thinking about that when you started talking about morality, that there's this underlying moral epistemology that might be even bigger than methodology, how we're concluding that those are good reasons. 
I'm, I'm glad this is where it went because I, I, I don't know. I think you just pushed my buttons and, and this was just an <laughs> organic reaction to this conversation. But, but, but I'm, I'm realizing right now that I have to give this some thought and okay. p- perhaps read, read that book you, you mentioned. Um, Completely okay. fine. Completely Anthony, good response. We're, we're going to do the crazy thing. We're going to move into the bonus questions. Again, you could look at it as rapid fire. You just answer them. Uh, yes, no, no, yes, no, all of them. But <laughs> how many seconds, we, how many seconds tops will I have for each question? You, as long as you, you like to spend on it. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. But so we already sort of touched on this, but take this any direction you want. Okay. What is a thing that you used to believe that you no longer believe? One thing that I used to believe is that when I throw, this is going to sound kind of benign, but when I toss things into the recycle bin, that they're going to be going to a recycle station and they will be recycled and I'm doing this great thing for the, for the earth. I'm not entirely sure that that's the case. Yeah. Uh, one piece of paper, is that really going to make it into the recycle area? Like, or is it better just to put cans in there in bottles? Like, <laughs> Sometimes I, I, I look, it sounds so stupid, but I look at the recycle and I'm like, there's no way that's going to get recycled. That's just, that's, that's just ridiculous. So that might be one of them. I think I've changed my views on open carry. I used to, I used to have a visceral reaction to seeing somebody in public with a pistol on their hip, which you can do in Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used to be against it, but it's conceivable that if there was a shooting here, it could take the cops seven minutes to get here. And there is somebody here that could potentially take that person out much quicker than a, than a cop. So I think I've, I've shifted on some views like that. Downloading right. music. I used to, I, I thought it was stealing to just take music from a person that you should be paying them. Well, somebody SE'd me on that claim over Facebook Messenger five years ago. And now I'm not so sure. I actually, I, th- I think today it might be beneficial for that artist if people are taking their music for free and it's spreading their, it's popularizing their music and they might sell more tickets later. Mm -hmm. All right. You, you gave me several answers. uh, (laughs) I I mean, I should, I I should SEU on your, um, on your recycling bin claim, (laughs) maybe some other time. (laughs) I'm not saying that nothing gets recycled, but I think there's, I d- I'm I'm dubious that everything I put in that recycle bin is going to be recycled. I, th- I, think, I think there are some limitations very, to it. Fair assumption, probably yeah. right. Okay, moving on to it to an easy one here. Free will, illusion or real? I hate free will talks. I think I don't think that we have free will. I think that we are we are material beings responding to stimuli. So this is all based on the physics of the universe that we happen to be in. And if we were to reset things, we would probably still be here right where we are today. Why why do you hate those talks? Hate is a strong word. I I just think that they're somewhat unproductive and I wouldn't behave any differently whether free will was real or not. So it's almost, don't you want to believe as many true things as possible? Well, of course, of course I do. I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that we'll be able to find out, one way or the other that we do have whether my belief is actually true or not so i'm open to it yeah I, I guess i shouldn't be so dismissive of it because you might actually be the person that can help me discover that i'm wrong on this so i'm, <laughs> I'm not closed on it <laughs> i've just had many conversations about free will and i just like okay here we go again right right i, I mean it's a yes no question but okay, you you gave an answer thank you okay i don't i don't know I, i've okay i've I'm going to replace this question with another question. What's your background professionally? Never heard you mention that. I don't have a professional background. I, my background is logistics and information systems. That's, that's the degree that I went you know, for school for back in the day. Mm. And I have an MBA in management. I, I was doing supply chain software consulting for a while. And then I ran my own business, a repair shop for fixing electronic devices. I worked at an insurance company in their logistics uh, department for a while, and then uh, primarily a stay-at-home dad. So I have no formal background in psychology or philosophy, anything along those lines. I'm about as as the average Joe maybe that you could be, which I think is in a way good because this method was developed for people to use, regardless of right. where you, your expertise on. So 
Uh, but that's my background. I don't, I don't have really a particular expertise in anything. Although ha- having done this for eight years now, I think, I think I, I've developed a certain affinity for this approach. Absolutely right. Next question: If okay. you could allocate, if you personally could allocate a trillion dollars to research, Whoa. which specific area would you give it to? Damn. That's I'm assuming good. it wouldn't be a supply chain logistics. Nope. It would be, I think it would be teaching critical thinking to kids and propagating that, that teaching so that for the next thousand years, that's what we're teaching people. Teaching, teaching people how to think more critically about the stimuli that they're encountering and being told is true and learning how to push back in a respectful way. Right. That's what I would put that money towards around the world it wouldn't just be my country like yeah because that's the biggest that's the biggest source of our of our that's the biggest problem i think that we're facing and it's it it influences so many other things our gullibility where there's a lot of gullible people out there and they they haven't been taught how to think critically right and and i think uh, just a follow-up remark on that it strikes me that that we all are actually not not because as individuals there's something wrong with us, but just because we inhabit these biological vessels and we all share that experience. I guess I'm just commenting on on your. <laughs> I, I won't add anything to that. <laughs> all right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next question: Have you ever had an experience that you, at the time, perceived as supernatural? I don't think so. Maybe when I was a kid, but right. certainly not as an adult. If I, if I was laying in, in a hotel room and I heard a squeak in the room, it might cross my mind that it was a ghost, but then I would, I would go through a series of questions and even start interrogating, why did I even consider that as an option? What are, what other things could it be? How could we figure out what's the case? So um, even as skeptical as I am, I suppose it might briefly cross my mind that maybe there's some sort of supernatural cause of this, but I think I would then in, enter a dialogue with myself to see if that was really justified. But um, generally, no, I, I don't, I don't think that there is a supernatural realm. Right. I, I, I get, so the follow-up question would have been if you had had something more tangible is whether your interpretation of that event has changed over the years. Okay. That's, that's actually sort of what you always told me. Yeah. I, I can't say that I've had one. Uh, at least I'm not remembering any. Right, right. Okay, so then we have the legacy question. This is really just a question that you can ask, and I want you to assume, as counterintuitive as it may seem to you, Anthony, of all people, uh, that there's an <laughs> an all-knowing being that's going to answer this question. What okay. is the number I can, one? I can enter, I can entertain that hypothetical. What's the question? What What single question would you like more than anything to have the answer to? Oh. Oh, I see. Assuming that there was a there was an all knowing being that could give me the answer to it, right? Hmm. Maybe it would be something like, "What do you think is the best way to reduce harm in humans?" So that would be sort of all encompassing, whether it's uh, crime, reducing crime, or decreasing childhood ca- cancer in kids, or something along those lines. How can we, what is the best way for humans to figure out how to reduce human suffering? Excellent. That might, that might be my question. There you have it. So now, now is the time where I tell you, I tricked you. I'm actually going to ask the next guest on the show this question. Hmm. And now I'm going to ask you the question that Gordon Gallup left, was, left us with. And I'm, I'm afraid it's sort of an evolutionary psychology question. But I am going okay. to ask you sure, to sure. abide to my own structure here. How did our sense of humor evolve? Our sense of humor? Mm. Well, I don't know, but my guess would be that it was probably some some form of social bonding that caught on, that it was probably socially advantageous to display a reaction of some sort when you encountered something that was unusual. It probably endeared you to the group. Maybe it relaxed people. There were probably some psychological benefits to 
to laughing at yourself, I suppose, or finding humor in things, or at the very least noticing that something was a little odd there when that happened. So I think that that was probably socially, socially selected for over time. Right. But I don't know. I have no clue. (laughs) And I'm glad you said that because even though it's, it's, it's not your domain of expertise, you're, you're, you're doing it right. You're showing people no shame in saying, I don't know. Absolutely. If somebody has a, a good hypothesis, that you would like to explore, I would love to explore that with you or go to one of the SE groups where we can explore that with you and see how you figured out that it's true. Right. And uh, we're approaching the moment where I say, thank you so much for talking to me. Oh, it's over. Hey, that was really fun. That was, that was completely different than most interviews that I do. You really got me thinking and what? I enjoyed it. Right. No. Yeah. I watched a few uh, other videos and I was like, no, this, oh, what was the one I saw? One of them was, was really interesting, but one of them was, was very boring. Um, <laughs> Because of the questions that were being asked, it was it was just like H one journalist. Oh, handling. boilerplate! How did you get started? How does SE work? I guess right. Maybe, is that yeah? But but, but I do okay. I do I do think you should you should just you formed a nonprofit, right? We did. Yes, I'm the executive director and one of the founders of a nonprofit that we started to promote street epistemology to people from around the world, nice. and it's called Street Epistemology International. Yeah, right. And uh, where, where can people find you if, if they want to just I'm all over your... social media. Just search for my name, Anthony Magnabosco. Probably head to my YouTube channel first. And then in any recent video description, most video descriptions of the recent ones, you should be able to find links to my website and where you can find me on uh, the various communities where we're practicing and discussing street epistemology. And yeah, I'm, I'm fairly accessible. You can message me on Twitter or Facebook or all all different platforms. Right. Yeah. Awesome. And obviously I'll be happy to leave links for all of that. Thank and, you for doing um, that. No, yeah. And I want to just say, I really, after watching the first two, three of your videos, something I realized this guy, no, I didn't realize I started suspecting this is not knowledge at all. This is just my own <laughs> see feeling. how cautious you're being with your words. <laughs> right, I <love> right, right. <laughs> Thanks for, uh, eliciting that reaction in me. But, but I was actually thinking this guy is going to go somewhere hmm. and I have to get him on the podcast. And those were the two thoughts I had. And, and I feel like the, it is, it's already started escalating for you right, to some degree. It's, isn't that right? Things are escalating. It's weird. Uh, no, it's not weird. Cause you, it's strange. It's strange though, but you have to understand you, hmm. it's under, it's, it's odd for, for me to like experience this because this isn't a concept that I came up with for one thing. This isn't my idea. I simply decided to see if it worked or not. And then I was uploading the videos and it's really caught on. And then if somebody invites me and they seem to have a good show and they respect their guests and they have a pretty decent audience, then I'll agree to go on. And it's picking up. Um, The number of views that are happening on my channel seems to be increasing. The number of people who reach out to me to want to volunteering to be one of my conversation partners, that's going up. But um, this is one of those things where it's it's sort of a all ships rise type of thing. So there are others in this community who are doing just what I do. And they're seeing growth on their channels. We're seeing more people wanting to discuss street epistemology and even critique it, which in and of itself is good. Right. So I, I feel almost, almost like I'm, I'm on this ride and I don't know where it's heading, but there seems to be something to it. And it's, it's fun. It's, it's, it, it blows my mind. I don't know where, where we'll end up. I don't know where I will be in five years. Will this just fizzle out and die? Or will we form some sort of, I don't know, program in the government where we're trying to you know, but actually put some real money behind this where we can start rolling this out on a massive scale or something in between. I don't know where we're going with it, but I, I can sure as hell tell you it's it's really a blast to be a part of it. Right. Would you Would you ever be willing to entertain like a coalition with, let's say, a moderate Christian group in the U.S. if they wanted to help spread... SE 
Yeah, absolutely. I've received offers to go and debate Christians at their conferences and I decline them. I right. offer to teach this method to them instead. I want them to learn this method. Now, what's interesting is that I, I get a lot of people, some theists who are very worried about this approach, which tells me, I think, something about the beliefs that they're holding. Yes. I, I have a suspicion, perhaps, that maybe they're not quite as confident in their views if they're not willing to learn this approach, because there's nothing wrong with this approach. In fact, they can probably help us make it better, but they're worried about it because I think it is a threat to, it is a, threat to a lot of people's views. But yeah, I, I, I'm completely fine. We, as, as the ED of this organization, we're looking at conferences that we want to go to to promote this method. And one thing that we're, we're, we're talking about is it doesn't even necessarily matter if we go to a convention that is of a political stripe that we don't affiliate with. It, that might actually be one of the best places to go. Because the more diversity and the more different views of people who we have practicing this method, that very well likely might be what it, we need to figure out the actual truth of the matter. Right. Right. I'm glad I asked that question, actually. Yeah, that yeah. was good. That was, that was a good thought. Right. Okay, Anthony, I'm going to say again, thank you so much. I really appreciate this conversation. Me too. I really loved it. It was great. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of MetaQuest, and please consider reviewing, writing a comment, sharing this podcast. I really rely on whatever support I get, so if you get value out of this, why not take this opportunity to share that value with someone you know, someone you think might benefit from it. Thanks for listening to MetaQuest. Have a good one. Cheers. <laughs>